Good evening. Um, welcome to the special meeting of the Santa Cruz County Board of Supervisors to discuss redistricting. This is October 28th, 2021 at 630. Uh, clerk, please call the roll. Supervisor Koenig. Here. Friend. Here. Tuner. Here. Here. Caput. Supervisor Caput is present. McPherson. Here. Thank you. You have a quorum. All right. Do we have consideration of uh, late additions to the agenda? We have no uh, late additions or corrections to the agenda, Chair. Okay. Very good. Uh, I will now um, we'll have a moment of silence and then uh, Pledge of Allegiance. It's a time for public comment. Uh, any person may address the board during the public comment period. Speakers must not exceed two minutes in length, and individuals may comment only on today's uh, subject of the special meeting on redistricting. Do we have anybody who'd like to address us? Thank you. My name is Becky Steinbrenner. I'm from the Aptos Hills area. I, I have a question. Will the members of the public be given an opportunity later in this meeting for speaking on the item up before us? Yes. Thank you very much. The others, any others who want to uh, speak? No, for the record, there are no members joining us via and Zoom. And you can speak on this item tonight uh, on redistricting later. Um, we'll go to the uh, item number five, the regular agenda of the special meeting of public hearing to consider maps and plans proposed by the Advisory De Redistricting Commission and members of the public accept and file report on the 2021 redistricting process and provide additional direction as recommended by the County Administrative Officer. I think Elisa Benson from the County Administrative Officer is gonna be presenting. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Good evening, board members. Uh, my name is Elisa Benson, Assistant CAO and Project Lead for the County's 2021 redistricting effort for supervisor supervisorial districts based on 2020 census. In addition to myself, we have Rita Sanchez, as well as Susan Perlman, Matt Price, Jenny Gomez, and I think our ARC 21 commissioners, O'Neill and Mosier, who are, are available virtually. And yes, our clerk of elections is here as well. Mm -hmm. And Ruby Marquez, who's been our county council on this item. So they're also available for questions this evening. Next slide, please. Before we get into this evening's festivities, I just wanna take a moment to review for the public the fundamentals of redistricting when we do this every 10 years. What is it? This is the process by which neighborhoods and communities are grouped together for purposes of elected representation. So this is a very important process. And then we try and get to substantial population equality across the districts. Why does this matter? Because in the past, redistricting has been used to exclude communities um, so this is why full engagement of the public and transparent processes are essential as we do this work. I will say as a staff member, this is the first time I've done this work. And then given that it comes every 10 years, it's so not something you get a lot of practice yet, but we've been exceptionally lucky to have Susan Perlman, who has marshaled this effort for I think the last three efforts prior to this with the county. And she's been a great teacher for all of us. I also, also want to put out there, it's been a little bit complicated, as you would imagine, by the COVID-19 global pandemic and how it had impacted both the census process and that had consequences for this process as well. But in any case, this is around people's voices being heard. So we wanted to make sure it is as transparent and open and inviting to the public as possible. Thank you. Next slide. So tonight's objectives, um, first I wanna just 
share with uh, the board and members of the public. This is the first of three public hearings that the board will be having. So this is not where we'll be taking any final action on a map. This is the, really the beginning of the board's consideration. I am with that in mind, gonna give a quick review of the agenda. First, because we do this every only every decade, um, and since there was some considerable changes in state law, we're gonna spend a little bit of time at the beginning of the agenda going over redistricting requirements as requirements and processes under the Fair Maps Act or AB 849. Then we'll talk about uh, the recommendations put forward by your advisory redistricting commission. Then we will hear public testimony and of course take any questions from the board. And then we'll be doing um, staff direction for the remainder of the public hearings. But I am gonna spend a little bit of time talking about the process because it is different than um, what, was ha what happened the last decade. Next slide, please. So as I've noted, there's been a number of changes in state law in 2018 and 19 with a, a bulk of those wrapped into the Fair Max, Maps Act or AB 849. I'm going to start. Lisa, you, I'm sorry, can I interrupt you? Um, getting a message that people are having ac difficulty accessing the Zoom meeting as a guest. It's telling them the host has another meeting in progress. You want me to pause? So, yeah, we should pause okay. since you're, if you could. Maybe you want to take a five minute break or Uh, all supervisors are present. Uh, there were no late additions to the agenda. Uh, we've had our pledge in a moment of silence. Uh, any person may address the board during this public comment period. Speakers must not exceed two minutes in length and individuals may speak only on today's uh, item on the special of this special meeting on redistricting. Uh, we will have now a presentation from the uh, CAO's office, Elisa Benson. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Elisa Benson, uh, Assistant CAO and Project Lead for our County Redistricting effort this year. We also have our staff team available if there's questions as we move through tonight's presentation. Before we get into, into tonight's festivities, I wanna take a moment to um, go through the fundamentals of redistricting for our viewing public. Again, so redistricting is about setting the boundaries for, um, for our elector electoral uh, officials and representation. This happens every 10 years after the uh, decennial census occurs. And what this is, is really how the selection of neighborhoods and communities are grouped together for purposes of elected representation. And it's, we, we base those districts with substantial um, equality across the, uh, across the district. So all the districts are of the same size. So now the audio is not coming at through. No, no, try, try. 
supervisor, supervisor friend, friend can, you can you hear us? Yes, we can hear you now. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I'll, I'll go back to districting and why does it matter? So this is a process we engage in every 10 years after the decennial census to determine the groupings of neighborhoods and communities for purposes of elected representation. And in doing so, uh, we do that so those, those districts in, in terms of population size are substantially equal. This matters because redistricting um, is how we ensure that we have uh, groups have their, their voice represented in, um, in the matters in front of their communities. And it's important that we have community uh, engagement and involvement in identifying uh, those redistricting boundaries as they, we do have a history in this country where redistricting has been used, used to exclude certain communities so it's incredibly important that we have full public engagement and our processes are transparent. So I just wanted to put that forward before we talk about tonight's, tonight's meeting and how it fits into a process in front of us. Next slide, please. So a quick review of tonight's agenda and for this special meeting, which is the first of three meetings that will, where the board will be considering changes in supervisorial districts. And just to, to make, make it clear for the public, um, there's no final action tonight. This is the first of this series. Because we do this every decade, and when, while it's familiar, it is still different. And since the last time this happened in 2011, we've had changes in state law that affect the process. So we wanted to take some time this evening to walk through the process to explain how it's different from what's happened in the past and how that's informed the process we took to get here today. We'll also be then presenting the ARC 21 recommendations. There will be opportunity for that very important public testimony. And then it will come back to the board for questions and then any directions to staff to inform the work at the next public hearings. So as I mentioned, there's been a number of changes in state law uh, regarding redistricting, particularly in 2018 and 19 with uh, the Fair Maps AB 849, uh, Fair Maps Act really informing our process. So I'm gonna start at the bottom of this slide and work my way up. So AB 849 sets up extensive uh, requirements around the record, keep, record keeping for this process, which is why establishing both our website and then the way we are um, managing any documents from the public or that are created in this process that they will be there. And this is maintained for 10 years as it says here and in multiple languages. The other aspect is there's a considerable number of requirements around public outreach and communication to again, provide as much opportunity for the public as, as possible to participate in these processes. And then the final section around the public hearing process, we'll spend a little bit of time on this and there'll be another slide that goes into our schedule in particular, but we have to have at least four public hearings. In the NAB 849, we are able to count one of the public workshops as one of those hearings. So that September 30th uh, workshop we did counts as your first public hearing and it was noticed as such. So this is effectively our second public hearing. And then there's also some um, specific noticing requirements, particularly around the publishing of maps that we have to meet as we, uh, we meet the requirements of the Fair Maps Act. So as I talk about the schedule, I'll point some of those out because they're a little bit different than our regular meetings. And really that most important one is that Final maps have to be published with seven days notice. So we'll walk through that in the process. But those details make it so we have some specific um, actions we're recommending for, for you to, for us to take moving through this process. Next slide, please. I'm gonna briefly go over the process that got us here tonight. Um, and I should say, I mentioned it, earlier, but obviously uh, the, the global pandemic has affected, it affected the census and it moving forward in 2020. And that timing of release of census data affected our process along the way. So really this, our, our um, redistricting experience can be broken into four different 
phases. The first was at the beginning of the year when uh, the board made the decision to, to establish uh, an advisory, uh, advisory redistricting commission. And so we first worked um, to build the county team and receive your nominations and then convene as we call them the ARC 21. And we started that in May. Then we moved on to access and outreach. So we launched our website. We started developing the online communities of interest tool and communities of interest is really the term we use for However, the, our, our community wants to define itself. There's lots of different ways. It can be school districts, geographical. Um, we all like birds. I mean, it's, it's really a self-defined uh, definition. And, and in your packet, there is the um, example, not examples, the actual community of interest forms we received via the website. We also outreach, um, press releases, social media campaigns. And then we developed a, an infographic in English and Spanish to share with community partners to encourage people to participate either online or in our workshops. And then the third phase was really that involvement engagement. So that's when we actually did those hybrid public workshops in community to, to, to invite people to participate in these conversations. And those the timing of those workshops are listed there. And now we're really in that fourth part of the process, the line drawing and mapping. And I should say, as I mentioned, one of the key, key inputs you need for this process is that census data. And unlike um, every other experience where that census data has been available in April, we did not receive that census data until late August. And it was a preliminary draft. And then the final approved official data wasn't, a, wasn't um, provided until September 20th. So this whole process has been done um, in anticipation of the data. The communities of interest are the communities of interest, but that data really does drive the process. I'm gonna go to the next, next slide, please. So this is the public hearing schedule that the board approved. As I mentioned, the first public hearing, we've met that requirement through that September 30th workshop. This is the second public hearing where you're actually receiving the ARC recommendations as well as testimony from the public on both those recommendations and any other ideas that the public would want the board to consider in making uh, decisions regarding changes to the district maps. The third, or I'm just gonna say our second public hearing for purposes of the board is going to be on November 9th. It's a regularly scheduled board meeting and we're hoping to be, have that be at a time certain at 1045. Again, making it very clear when folks can participate. Uh, in that, this is where one of the nuances comes up. In that, in the November 9th public hearing, we have asked that, and you'll see these in the recommended actions, that we accept maps from the public up until November 2nd. The reason for that is to meet the noticing requirements for the 9th. And similarly, we after that point, um, if there are subsequent changes, it could move the entire meeting schedule. We'll continue to take comments. The question is if someone's submitting specific maps that they want you to consider. Um, and then, uh, this, so this is what would allow the schedule to then have you take final action on the 16th um, and will be well in advance of the, the requirement to be completed by uh, December 15th, or I'm sorry, yeah, December 15th. This schedule provides additional time if you need it beyond this hearing schedule, but there are some complications related to SB 594 and the candidate filing period if we push much further into November. So we, we think this is gonna provide you adequate time to evaluate the recommendations of the ARC and public testimony and make those final decisions on the 16th. I'd be happy to pause for any questions at this point around this different piece of the process. Any questions from the board? Okay, we'll keep going. Next slide, please. 
But we're going to move from that process overview to the work of the commission. So on you on the screen is our uh, advisory registering commission members, and uh, the, our five uh, working members met seven times in terms of the ARC meetings themselves, as well as attended all of the public workshops. So we had a very great committed a group of folks um, and, and we really want to appreciate and, and offer our gratitude for their time, their commitment and the experience they brought to this process. Next slide, please. Just for the public, what do ARC 21 commissioners do? Well, first, they really are the eyes and the ears of the supervisors. They participated both in those formal engagement workshops to listen to the public, but they also had their own community conversations to understand how people considered and defined their communities of interest. They spent a quite a bit of time learning about federal and state related election law and those criteria that inform making these changes. And as I mentioned, they started looking at the data, the, the, first, the first pass of data in late August to understand what was the math underneath um, the redistricting effort. Next slide, please. I wanted to spend a quick minute providing an overview of the legal requirements. As we mentioned, there's both federal and state. I'm happy to take questions on this, but really, so the first, first and foremost is that, that effort to get towards equal, substantially equal population. We'll talk a little bit more about that when we see the data. And of course, compliance with our Federal Voter Rights Act, Voting Rights Act. In terms of the state requirements, and this is again to the extent practicable, there are five ranked criteria, criteria, criteria excuse me, that, that question of a geographical, geographical contiguity, you want sort of things need to connect, you can't skip over. The use of identifiable boundaries. So frequently that's gonna be natural, artificial streets, natural features, so people have a sense of, the, of place. Geographical compactness, you want sort of the most normal looking lines and not drawn sort of long stretches to reach one pocket or another, but so geographical compactness. And then I'm sorry, and identifiable, ba identifiable boundaries we spoke about. Most importantly, political parties, that lines can't be drawn to favor or discriminate against any political party, incumbent, or candidate. So that, that is sort of an underlying requirement in both in federal and state law. Next slide, please. So before you hear are the actual, uh, the data coming out of the census, I wanna point out there is one small typo in District 4 on the over under, it should be 0.72%, not 0.072%. So what's important about this is the over under is really a calculation based on that target population of 54,270 as the population within each of the districts. And then you'll see in the total population from the census, we see what that count was based on the 2020 census. And you see what we label the over and under. And then the next, the next uh, column shows that in terms of a percentage. So with all of our districts, we are well below 5% sort of that margin of error or what shall I say, the, the margin for getting to substantially equal. So in terms of legally meeting substantially equal, these values meet that, meet that test. However, we still need these, these districts to be consistent with what people identify as communities of interest today. And you still wanna advance those ranked criteria we just walked through. So to the extent that there are communities of interest or other criteria, um, compactness that are can be advanced and get closer to substantially equal. That's what we asked our commissioners to consider. We're in good shape here in terms of the numbers, but that wasn't enough. We needed to look at, is there any changes that needed to be made to reflect communities of interest or any of those other criteria? 
So with that, I wanna pause and see if there's any questions about this component, this base input to, to the redistricting effort. Okay, we'll keep going. We're gonna move on to the ARC 21 recommendations. Uh, so there, we will get to, and, and as you know, in your in your agenda packet, there are two recommendations from the ARC 21. There were a number of other proposals from commissioners that were discussed, as well as a map from the public. However, and those are in your packet and included as, as attachments. However, none of those were recommended by the ARC for the board's consideration. So they are available in your packet and for the public, but we're not gonna be speaking about those tonight unless there's some questions. So the first proposal, which we've just labeled proposal A, is a proposal that would move population from district three east of the, of the harbor um, into district one. And it's about 613 people. So what that would do effectively is um, reduce, <laughs> it, it, it improves getting towards substantially equal by uh, reducing the over for district three. And it slightly increases um, from being under in district one to being just over. Um, input from community around um, having all of Live Oak and that and that neighborhood in particular in one district as right now it was split into two. Any questions about that proposal? Uh, that's people, not voters. That is people. People. Next proposal. The second proposal we're just calling proposal B is a. Uh, move between District 2 and District 4. This is the Apple Hill community within Watsonville, and it would move residents of Silver Lake and Green Meadow Drives from District 2 to District 4, and it's about 491 people. Similarly, this just gets us a little closer to substantially equal by uh, reducing um, District 2 from being slightly over to being slightly under and reducing the amount, I'm sorry, yes, reducing the amount over from District 4 from 0.72% to 0.18%. So again, just a little bit of um, changes around the edges to get closer to substantially equal. So both of these proposals advance that criteria around substantially equal. Any questions about proposal B? Great. So this is just basically a, a larger map that does that comparison. Um, you can see there is some, so let me see if I can, if I can get a pointer on here. You can see there's a small red area. The first, uh, thank you, here. Thank you. And then the other one you'll see at the other edge. Sort of. So these are small edges around the districts, but they do um, work towards that substantially equal. And this, the table here also indicates that, that all the districts with the exception of District 5 get a little bit tighter around zero with these proposals. So with that, we can take the next slide. And this is the time for additional questions of staff or our ARC 21 um, commissioners. And then we would move on to public comment. I think I'll ask if any other board members have any questions. None from Madam Clinic, none from me. Anybody uh, that's virtual would like to ask a question? All right, Supervisor. Uh, this is Ryan Coonerty. Um, I, uh, overall, I appreciate the direction of the, of the, um, working group and, you know, um, moving the district into, uh, the making live Oak continuous. Um, I, I do have some small concerns about, uh, the D district three being several thousand people over. Um, I think it's likely that there was a, at least a small undercount at the census, uh, uh, at UCSC because of, COVID, um, 
if there's interest, you know, adjusting the lines so as to make the districts even, uh, I'd be supportive of that. If there's not, um, you know, we're within well within the the legal limits to leave it, and so um, I can I can stick with that. Um, any other questions from board members, Supervisor Friend or Caput? Uh, yeah, thank you. Uh, can we go back to the slide? Uh, it showed uh, Apple Hill. Uh, that's correct. Uh, but I saw something that said Silver Leaf. Uh, there was a slide uh, right before uh, we came to this point. <laughs> okay, the one right before this. That's a silver leaf there. Oh, no. There might be a lag. Go, go, go ahead. You go to proposal B. Oh, okay. That's, is yeah. that the question you had? Here we go. Let me look. Uh, uh, include Silver Leaf and Green Meadow Drives. So I, I already have those, right? It, it, I think it just moves the remainder of it into district. All right, the remainder. Okay. Yes. That's fine. Okay. Thank you. Okay. It just threw me off a little bit. Okay. Um, no other questions? As, is this for the, the time for the public? Asking yeah, questions? if there's no questions of staff or of commission, absolutely time for public comment. Staff, or, are there any public comments? Thank you, Becky Steinbrenner from the Aptos Hills. Um, I, I would like some explanation about why the ARC 21 did not uh, accept any of the proposed, um, the map that Mr. Coffus submitted, I thought was very good. <laughs> and maybe it didn't address the population or would not easily address the population. I would like some explanation. And, and I do know that there it was touched on just very briefly in the document, but why wasn't that pursued? And um, I saw in the public co uh, correspondence, many people asked for the city of Scotts Valley to be united under the same uh, supervisor. And I have spoken with some people that live in Scotts Valley and apparently that was an issue that was in Supervisor Koenig's campaign. So I think it really needs to be addressed and I don't see it being addressed here. I also, having run for second district supervisor, know that in Capitola, it is a mess <laughs> trying to figure out which streets, which areas are which supervisor. And sometimes the people who live there don't even know. So I think the boundaries of the city of Capitola really need to also be uh, addressed as a community of interest. And I really felt that Mr. Coffice's map did that in a very good way and addressed the real disparity between rural dwellers and the population centers, not only as a voice, because there are a lot more voters there than there are in the rural areas, but also the uh, funding for our roads. Measure D, money is divided among districts and it gets, it. thank you. I see you're gonna allow me a little more time, thank you. And it gets very difficult because the rural roads get nothing. And yet they're critical for our rural residents for fire evacuation, for public safety response. And the rural people are really not getting fair represent, representation. I thought Mr. Coffins's map did a really good job of trying to address that. So um, I hope that, um, that those things can be addressed and a little more discussion around the recommendations that the public made and why they're not being taken. Thank you very much. I know, I assume I wasn't at those here, uh, those meetings that the hearings that they had, but I do believe my understanding is that those presentations were fully discussed by the commission, but that wasn't the recommendation. Um, I don't know the reasons for or against that. I think it was, Probably population numbers, but. Um, 
I think that uh, I'm happy to provide a little bit of insight into the commission's discussion of the particular map that the speaker is speaking is addressing. It was a considerable redrawing of the of the boundaries. Um, and something so significant in change uh, and not necessarily in alignment with those ranked criteria that that these changes must be um, aligned with, uh, that they did not feel comfortable pushing that forward. And further, that it was such a significant redrawing of the boundaries, it would require extensive community outreach and engagement to see if there was any interest or if people felt that that was disruptive to the communities of interest that the current boundaries represent. So it was, um, a, I don't wanna say a wholesale redrawing of, of the supervisorial districts, but a, a dramatic change in terms of how representation worked. In particular, one of the elements that was a, a regular discussion with the ARC um, was the decision, um, I think it was two, I might get this wrong, I may have to ask Susan this, two redistricting processes ago where in this community there was a decision to have um, each city represented by two supervisors. So that the, the, the idea was that everyone would have more than one um, supervisor um, re reflecting a city interest as well. And this that map in particular um, shifted that uh, that practice of this community away. So that was why they didn't feel like it was uh, appropriate to recommend it for consideration. So it was that two supervisors representing a city would be a value to that city in essence. I'm, yes, I mean, yeah. so that's been our practice um, the last to now this would be the third uh, redistricting effort where that, that's the idea, that that having more supervisors represent a city as well as unincorporated areas provides um, that city better opportunity, the residents of that city better opportunity for representation at in county affairs. Is it, uh, was there something to it too that um, do not change, if people, the statement was made, they don't know which district they're in or so forth. But the other point that I heard third hand was that if we don't need to change what people are used to for 10 years, let's don't change it. I mean, that's a general statement. I, there... I, well, I think you guys are going to get me putting my primo hat on, you know, there's not just don't change something because it's not broken. I think that the more important question in this uh, analysis is around what does it do to communities of interest? So, I mean, don't just changing something um, without understanding that it might disrupt the current representation of communities of interest um, that we didn't want to engage in those kinds of activities. Are there any other questions here in the public? Uh, any other, anybody on the phone? There are no members of the public on the same that would like to question. Okay. Um, do you want to continue now? <laughs> I would I would be happy to continue. So where we are, if we could go back to the PowerPoint, where we are at this point is two recommendations. And so I'm just going to walk through the recommendations. Since there is a long list here, there's our, our regular recommendation of accepting and filing the staff report. Um, then that really initiating this process of the public hearing um, uh, and considering the map, the proposals that are in front of you, we're doing, this is the first evening of that consideration. There is um, considerable testimony in your packet, those community of interest forms and other public testimony that those are formally part of your record for considering um, boundary changes. It's the opening of the public hearing and receiving testimony tonight. Um, well, I'm gonna circle back to the providing direction in a moment, um, but it's also, we're gonna be continuing the public hearing until November 9th. Um, and then we'll be holding that final public hearing on the 16th. I just wanted to again, circle back to that Second from the bottom recommendation that this is also saying that for to receive maps that we need to receive those by November 2nd, so we can meet the noticing requirements for the subsequent public hearing. So that direction is in there as well. 
So those are the, the formal ones. Excuse me, is, and is that um, public hearing November 9th, is that a specific time of 1045? Yes, right. sir. Both, okay. we, are, we are recommending that we have both, uh, this is an, a time certain item on the 9th regular, the November 9th regular meeting and the regular meeting on November 16th. So the other thing that is here is if there's any other adjustments or ideas you would like us to prepare for you for consideration on the 9th, we would appreciate hearing them now. So we have time for that. Any uh, questions, any board members? Yes, thank you, Chair. Um, is there a specific tool that members of the public should use to submit a proposed map? Sure, absolutely. Um, Avenues of interest forms, but there's also uh, some opportunities to um, use the redistricting software if they want to submit, use that software and submit a map. And those those should go through to our redistricting email. Actually, maybe Rita, do you want to talk about that a little bit? How to submit any maps or? Well, we are required and able to take maps in any format. It doesn't have to be the online mapping tool. It can be anything written on a piece of paper. Um, so we will accept them if people email them to, I uh, believe, and I hope I don't get this wrong, uh, redistricting2021 at santacruzcounty.us. Bring them in in person to the fifth floor of the county building or mail them in um, to us. Um, but online, we do have a free mapping tool that's available on our redistricting website under the mapping and data tab. And on that page is information on GIS staff, which will be able to help with kind of going through the mapping software to be able to submit maps. Great, right, see the link now, it's fantastic. Um, Supervisor Friend, any questions? Yeah, you know, I don't. I don't really have any questions. Let's make a couple of brief comments. First, I just wanted to express my appreciation, in particular, to the GIS team. Uh, they did a lot of work during this entire process. There were a lot of iterations of the mapping going back and forth between the ARC, uh, the, pre, the the advisory committee, and so I just wanted to really appreciate the work of county staff and, in particular, the GIS team on this. I also wanted to acknowledge. Uh, that there really aren't very large uh, changes that are being proposed right now. And I think that that is appropriate. I think that the District 2 change in the Apple Hill area to District 4 makes a lot of sense from a community of interest standpoint. But I think that we should also put a marker out there that um, a bit to what Supervisor Coonerty noted, there clearly was an undercount in this previous census due to COVID. And in particular, I think that undercount was most acute in the South County, in particular in Watsonville. So I would anticipate with UCSC growth occurring, I would anticipate with a correct count uh, at the next census in Watsonville that, that a, a future board's gonna be looking at a, um, at a need to really consider a, 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 a different look at the maps than, than our board is looking at. We, we fell within a very, uh, within a population, uh, the current districts fall within a current, the population uh, requirements, so we don't really need to change anything. And I think that there's a value in, in not having a wholesale change. But I also think that that realistically, the numbers aren't accurate. And I think this is an issue that are, that's going to be occurring across the country. And I think in particular, um, the second and fourth districts are going to uh, be looking a bit different at the next census than they do currently. And I think the third and fifth districts are going to be looking a bit different because of the UCSC growth. And it's just something that uh, our communities are going to need to prepare for moving forward. Good points. Uh, Supervisor Coonerty, comments? Yeah, I, I want to appreciate all the, all the work. Um, I, I'm not, right now, I'm, I'm not going to uh, move with additional direction, but I think, um, you know, in, before the next meeting, I mean, I'll have a discussion with my colleague. Uh, I'm not interested in, I, I know how hard it is for my colleagues to represent the unincorporated areas and be a full service government. So I'm not interested in um, moving uh, any any sort of uh, unincorporated residents uh, from my district district into other districts, but uh, but perhaps there's a way to make these numbers uh, more even and and prepare for the for the changes that will be significant, I think, coming forward um, 
in the for the next census. Thank you, Supervisor Caput. Yeah, uh, thank you. Thank you very much. I, I want to thank uh, the redistricting uh, commission also. Um, I guess the last thing we needed was uh, to have to if we had to do this ourselves. It would with uh, everything else going on. It would have been overwhelming, I think. So uh, they've clarified it. Hey, if there was an undercount, the biggest area of an undercount was like I agree with uh, Supervisor Friend. Uh, the biggest undercount would probably be in uh, South County uh, because uh, uh, when you're counting population, you're you're counting undocumented or documented people. Yeah, and then you have families uh, would we call blended families where some are uh, here with papers and some are not. And uh, it's very difficult to count uh, all, also the DACA um, students that are actually enrolled in school, whether or not they're actually counted uh, because they don't have documentation. So uh, I guess the, with, the considering COVID and everything else that was going on, I think the census people did the best job they could, and uh, uh, we have to deal with the numbers they, they gave us. Uh, the only other question I had was, uh, it said something about uh, two of the public hearing meetings would be after 6 p.m., but I wasn't sure if it said uh, for sure or it said or. Uh, that was right at the beginning of the, uh, uh, the meeting. Uh, if we're going to do it at 10.45 a.m., are, are we going to still meet the uh, legal requirements? It works out when you Go ahead. Oh, I'm happy to answer that, Supervisor Caput. I think sure. it's only one meeting has to be in the evening. And actually, technically, we've had two meetings. We've had okay. this meeting and then the first, because the workshop, the evening workshop on September 30th was officially our first public hearing on this we've actually had we've we've been gone past that expectation and the next two meetings would be at your regular meeting during the day at 10 45. okay thank you thank you yeah i, I too would like to thank the uh the commission uh first district sherry o'neill second district michael watkins who was the chair third district chris reyes fourth district peter radden Fifth District, Jim Mosier. Uh, they put a lot of time into this, uh, heard a lot of comments. Uh, their their service is very much appreciated. So with that, I would entertain- Chair, I'll, oh, I'll just actually, uh, yeah, one final comment. Um, yeah, I, I wanted to speak to the map submitted by the public, which I think a member of the public uh, commented on, which effectively makes uh, the, the better half of the North County into one very large district five and, and essentially two um, mostly rural districts. I'll just say that, you know, in my brief time on this board, um, I've come to appreciate the fact that pretty much all the districts include both urban and rural parts of the county. I think that that also cr actually creates opportunities. Uh, the, the fact that we that we all essentially represent both our urban and rural residents. Um, you know, if you banish, or I should say, if you create two all rural districts, you've essentially banished the rural residents to a minority on this board. Uh, and it become very hard, I think, um, for them to ultimately Pass issues that are that are in their interest. Um, you know, rural road third vote going to come from if if the other three supervisors all represent entirely urban districts. Um, so I know it's a bit counterintuitive to think that um, you know you, you you want one representative who just represents a, a rural area, but it, in fact I think uh, the the current um, situation actually leads to the best representation for both urban and rural residents. Yeah, do, do I have any other comments from the board members? Um, entertain a motion to continue this public hearing to the best, uh, next board meeting on November 9th at 1045. I'll move the recommended actions. Second. Please call the roll. Supervisor Koenig. Aye. Friend. Aye. Coonerty. Aye. Caput. Aye. McPherson. Aye. Thank you, motion passes unanimously. Okay. A uh, real quick question. Did we have a roll call at the beginning of this meeting? Did we have, uh, was it an actual roll call? 
Yes, we did. And then there were some uh, sound difficulties, but everybody was present when we we, okay. called, we were called to order. So we were, we're all, all present here. from the start. Yes. We were here from the beginning. Okay. Yes. Thank you. Okay. This, this, um, this hearing will be continued to November 9th at 1045 a.m. in this uh, board chambers. Thank you, sir. Thank you.